Hey, what's happening, everybody? Welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 822, with my guest today, Damon Stiff. I'm Jeremy Lesniak. I host Martial Arts Radio. I founded Whistlekick, and I love traditional martial arts. I've been training my whole life, and I bet you also love your training, and that's why you're here. We come together as martial artists in a number of ways, this show being one of them. What are some of the other ways, some of the events, the trainings, the things that we do? Go to whistlekick.com, check them out, use the code PODCAST15 to save 15% on just about anything over there. We got some cool stuff, and it's constantly changing. Now, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com has all the stuff for the show, all the show notes, all the transcripts, all the links, all that good stuff for this and every episode we have ever done, so you can consider checking that out. If you like what we do, if our mission to connect, educate, and entertain resonates for you, if our goal of getting everyone in the world to train for just six months means something to you, please consider supporting us. There are a few things that you can do. You can join the Patreon, patreon.com slash whistlekick. You can leave reviews. You can buy books. You can come to events, tell friends, all great stuff. But here's another thing you can do. You can support our sponsors. Today's episode is brought to you by Kataro. And if you know Kataro, you probably know them for making the best martial arts belts in the world. In fact, the word Kataro means weaver. Did you know that? Kind of cool. And their mission, very similar to ours, but in a different way, to provide extraordinary service that creates a memorable experience that honors each martial artist's journey. If you watch me looking off screen, I wanted to make sure I got that right. And if you use the code WK10, capital W, capital K, numbers one zero, you can get 10% off your first order at Kataro. All their stuff's handmade in the USA. And I think that that's really, really cool. I've got a Kataro belt. I like it. <laughs> it is an amazing belt. And there are two categories of you out there. You either know what Kataro does, you've experienced their quality, and you're nodding along with me right now, or you don't know about Kataro. So I want to urge you, go to Kataro.com, K-A-T-A-A, two A's, R-O, that's K-A-T-A-A-R-O.com, and check out everything they've got. Use the code WK10, capital letters, to save 10% on your first order. Today's episode is with Damon Steph. And as with many of our episodes, there are common threads with other episodes, other guests, other stories. But there's a point in here where it takes a rather hard left as Devon talks about wanting to shed light, bring experience to, and understand himself, something that is not discussed in the martial arts world, at least very little, and he's had a large share in improving that conversation, African martial arts. Hmm. So we're going to talk about his journey and how he got to the point where he could start doing this work on historical African martial arts. And it's absolutely fascinating. I'm sure you'll enjoy it. Here we go. Hey, come on. Welcome. Thanks for being here. It's my honor. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I appreciate it. Well, you know, I, I was checking out some of your YouTube videos beforehand and actually in part because... I want to make sure I got this, the pronunciation of your name right. We don't get too many people on that have an apostrophe in their name. Yes. And, yes. you know, names, right? Like, yeah, trying yeah. to get names, right? Yeah, uh, the, the, the apostrophe is important. It's kind of like the fantasy characters, like the fantasy names, like the apostrophe uh, helps, you know, accent it and make it. You're, you're throwing me back to, like, when I used to read Anne McCaffrey stuff. Uh-huh. Yeah. Do you remember those books, the Pern books? and. When they mm -hmm. became a dragon rider, their name became a contraction. Yeah, that's so. Mom, may, you ride yeah. dragons. I, I that's really all dragon I have to born. say. That, yeah, dragonborn. <laughs> right. Um, you know, we're we're going to talk about you and your and your story here, and a little bit of foreshadowing. My gut tells me that we're going to end up in some directions we haven't gone often, perhaps ever, on this show, and that excites me. But let's let's roll tape back to the beginning. It's a martial arts show. You're a martial artist. We're here to talk about martial arts. What was your first experience with martial arts? <sighs> well, um, I mean, it was a dark and stormy night. 
and my father gave me the gift, the gift of a sword. That's usually how the story goes. Um, I was six years old, and uh, my dad showed up with two gifts. I'm giving you a different answer to this one. I normally I answer just with the sword. Uh, he gave me a sword, a toy sword, and a toy gun. And um, mind you, you can see all the gray and white in my beard. This was like the 80s where it was like, you know, that was a thing and all that kind of stuff. So um, um, it was almost like if, you, if you've if uh, you seen um, Shogun Assassin, uh, the Lone Wolf and Cub series where he's, uh, the, the, the father is like going to take the road of vengeance mm-hmm. and he gives his son a choice, like, you know, choose the sword or choose the ball and you'll join your mother, choose the sword. And you'll come with me as we walk through, you know, the road of hell and revenge. So, like in that moment for me, I gravitated towards the sword. Um, and it was like, you know, looking back at it, it was like this, it was like a just this cheap lead filled, silvery. It was like it was a silver, it had a silvery hilt, a silver scabbard with like cheap plastic jewels, purple, mm. reds, and greens, and and the blade was like black and I was just like I just I just loved it. You know what I'm saying? That's like I played with it until it like completely fell apart. Yeah. And then like salvaged as much of it as I could and just like it it left this impression in me. Like after I had lost it, it was all said and said and done when it was gone. It just left this like this this like this hunger, this curiosity in me. Um that I was looking for things, you know, I was looking for more things about weapons and about warriors and about, you know, just uh, the the story of, of people standing up against, you know, impossible odds. And, you know, I found, I found a lot of, um, uh, what is the word? I, I guess I found that in media at the time, you know, watching movies. So a lot of like, um, uh, of course, kung fu movies from like the seventies and eighties. Um, watching some of the peplum, the uh, sword and sandal movies and stuff mm-hmm. like uh, Clash of the Titans, and uh, of course, Excalibur was like a big thing in my a big, big, big in my rotation. But just anything that had to do with like, you know, warriors, warrior culture, um, fighting the good fight, standing against impossible odds. Like that was where like my heart was like, you know, really, really connected with that. Uh, so the way it worked for me, because uh, uh, martial arts was a thing that a lot of us growing up in my neighborhood, we didn't really have access to in the same way where you, there weren't like lots of dojos around. Um, at that time, what was considered a martial art was a very, very um, small category out of, you know, when we look at the body of like. Sure combat tradition that we have today it's like you know martial arts is a worldwide thing and it's it has different faces from combat sports to war dances to you know this 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 all embracing large tree with several branches of different manifestations of warrior traditions um and so at the time like martial arts was very uh, defined primarily as like east asian uh combat traditions that mm-hmm. were practiced you know in the United States or wherever else. So karate, kung fu, um, aikido, uh, you know, I think like aikido and judo was like exotic stuff. Karate was like, you know, a little bit more like accessible. But so anyways, as a kid, there weren't any studios around. So like the way we, the way I practiced my introduction and where I got my feet wet and it was like, we would watch the uh, movies. Mm. And then we would go outside and we would reenact the movies. And uh, you're certainly not alone. We've had pl- quite a few people on the show for whom that was that was the first few years. Mm-hmm. 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 Yeah. And, and so by doing that, it kind of it it um, it instilled this idea of like martial arts as um, you know, of course, it's like training you how to fight and how to be badass or whatever else but it was also like about uh being able to tell stories and about like personal expression like you can express who you are you know through these movements and through how you fought and that was a something that really stuck with me as a kid Hmm. 
that and just going on my gut here talking about the way the way that your father kind of gave you this choice and then you know going on and, and finding some some passion for protector hero types um you know if this was this was a therapist's office you know they'd look at that and say you know did you you know did you feel like you had to be the protector oh yeah big time at a young age you know uh, and it can, can you speak to that a bit because it sounds yeah, like it really course. informed your martial arts destiny most definitely most definitely so um i'm the youngest um my brother and my sister they are 10 uh 10 years older than me they've they passed away now so rest mm -hmm. in peace I'm sorry uh, yeah i appreciate that uh so they're 10 years older than me my mom um she met my father and they were married briefly and then they separated when i was young so um my mom was a very beautiful woman um very vibrant woman and i as a kid i always felt like it was like my duty to like be her shield mm. and to like protect her so like any i was a kid like if you tried to date my mom i'd be the kid that make it really really difficult for you to <laughs> get any progress you know <laughs> yeah. um sometimes you know it was through my antics other times it was through me like you know being very very directly saying this is you know no this is my mom like no not at all so um yeah, maybe he hear me in the back. He's called me a sucker. <laughs> but um, on the other end of that, also being the youngest kid, um, and then doing things like in the in the eighties, you know, in a lot of ways we were like left to kind of problem solve interpersonal stuff on mm -hmm. our own, right? Uh, so that dealt that you know meant you know conflict with very seldomly just with words it, it meant like right. having to fight a lot um so i was a really quiet reserved kid and um i couldn't always call my my big brother was this you know he was an all-around athlete big strong guy uh looked like a wrestler to me in my mind as a child it reminded me like he's kind of larger than life it's really big strong guy but i can never really only only in some very very severe cases would i ever call him to like help me out in a in a situation mm -hmm. I, I typically basically had to kind of fend for myself um and so like um martial arts uh was like my armor mm -hmm. um being even just like even just like watching the movies and going outside and adapting that into like what i did um it gave me like a different I mentioned in my um my you know the kids that were in my same neighborhood who probably weren't getting those kinds of influence and you know like yeah I I wanted to be I I felt the need to have to like one to protect myself um to be able to like because you know like I said I'm a, I'm was quiet very reserved very soft spoken and usually those are the kids that end up and I was a loner mm -hmm. um and usually those are the kids that you know, get targeted. And so, yeah, I wouldn't start fights. I wouldn't cause trouble. Um, I definitely would fight when the situation arose. I didn't win all my fights, but I definitely, you know, showed up for them. Mm -hmm. um, and martial arts and just the the mythology of the, the warrior helped me to like, to, to, to do that. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that. Mm, of course. So w where does where does your journey take you from there? Okay. So um I formally it takes me to football. Okay. Football. Asthmatic, skinny. Where did you grow up? Where did I grow up? Yeah, let's start there. So I grew up Where'd in you... Austin, Texas. Okay. So uh, football. It was you almost didn't have a choice, right? Football culture it, there is so it, prevalent. It, it it is. My brother was a football player. Um, he was a football player, track star, 
baseball, outdoorsman, mm. artist. He was all those things. My stepfather was military. So we lived in Austin for a bit and then we moved, we kind of bounced around to different uh, different states and different cities. So we had moved when I, I went to a, my next phase of my martial arts training happened when we were stationed. He was stationed in uh, Panama City, Florida. Mm -hmm. And so um, I wanted to like um, impress him. And I was like, well, the football players, they wear armor. And I'm like, I can go be a football player and then, you know, kind of do this thing. So I went out, I tried out for the youth center um, football team, uh, the Tyndall Falcons, and I made the team. And um, I'm doing the thing, but, you know, the only problem is, like, I have um, this disease that didn't exist back in the 80s called asthma. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, um, sorry. It's okay. So, um, yeah. So I had asthma. It made it very difficult for me to like keep up with the, with all the running. And my coach was very, you know, ill prepared to like teach breathing exercise, even just to be sensitive to that kind of stuff. You know, like my coach was like the, um, the, um, like stereotypical, 80s football coach you know like handlebar mustache he wore like the cap with the mesh bag yeah. he wore the shades the tight shorts you know what i'm saying and then the shirt tucked in there and he's just like you know real clipboard for no reason you know he like, <laughs> down with harsh harsh cell but um you know so i started to um i i was having asthma attacks after after training and um, I started lying and skipping out on practice. And um, my dad would like ask me, like, what, you know, like, you know, well, what'd you do today? Like, what you guys learn? Like, what's your, what's um, what you got to work on? And I would make up stuff like, yeah, you know, I'm got to go and work this and do that. And, you know, it got to a point where we were getting our positions for the team, like where, what, what roles we we're going to serve. My dad asked, and I'm like, yeah, I'm going to be a, wide receiver I, I i didn't to this day i don't know what a wide receiver does i didn't know back then i just knew that a wide receiver was something important and so you know um i told him that i was lying and it eventually caught up to to me um my dad and the coach my parents and my coach had a conference ended up that i was actually not going to be a wide receiver i was going to be a tight end I still don't know what the heck a tight end does to this day. But um, again, it was the 80s. Instead of them like signing me out of out of football, they said, hey, pack your stuff up. Go walk down there and tell the coach that you're that you're quitting. And I'm nine years old at this time, eight, maybe mm -hmm. eight at this time. And um, I go to this guy and I'm like, hey. You know, he's like, everyone's like, I can, I can still see it today. Like, everyone's already out in the field. I'm late. He has his, like, he has his, his thing in his hat. And he's, like, doing his thing. Yeah. And he walks, I walk up to him. I got the the, the shoulder pad, the helmet through the shoulder pads. So I'm, I'm doing a walk of shame. And he's like, stiff, get dressed out. And I'm like, sorry, coach, I can't. What do you mean? And I explained to him that I have this this breathing illness called asthma. And then he proceeds to like, you know, um, question my manhood and my tenacity, call, <laughs> um, calling me a bunch of things I won't say right now. Right. And um, I walked off the field. I was like very, very embarrassed. I felt, you know, already again, um, a very soft spoken kid, uh, a very reserved kid, you know, and struggling with this idea of like what masculinity is and stuff so i'm walking off the field going back to my bike and just feeling like you know feeling you know not really good about it mm -hmm. and so i'm driving past i'm pedaling past the youth center and i remember there's this guy in the youth center his name is sunny mm -hmm. 
And uh, Sonny was a break dancer, was a breaker, and he was a martial artist. And um, I remember him doing like uh, seeing him uh, break and seeing him do like uh, these crescent kicks in the in the in the rec center. And I was like, you know, they have a karate class at the rec center. I should just go and you know sign up. So I went to the youth center, got the paperwork um, for the karate class, and I took it to my mom and um, told her that I wanted to do it. My stepfather was like, you know, and then martial arts was very, very mis mystical at this time as well, right? And so my stepfather was like, yeah, you don't have the discipline to do this, you know, blah, blah, blah. You know, it's like, this takes a lot of, you know, all this stuff. And, you know, so it was kind of put on hold for a bit. And then he went to a TDY, which is like a, it's temporary active duty. So it's like when you're stationed in one spot, then you go to another spot for a couple of months or whatever else. So when he mm -hmm. went to TDY, I went ahead, we went ahead and signed myself up for the karate class. So when he came back, I was already in the class. So um, I started doing a, um, it was an Okinawan style. I'm not sure if it was a uh, Shorn Haru, but um, it was, um, it was an Okinawan system. Uh, my sensei, I think his name was Don. He was super like, super geeked out when the karate kid came out this is a, i'm dating myself like yeah. he was excited like oh man they were doing they did the crane kick the crane stance it was very similar to our cat stance and he was like relaying all of this stuff um about it so really really hype. So this is about 80 you know 85 right um so i did i did that i started doing karate but i to be honest my dad was sort of right um, I was not, I was not ready for, I was not ready for the discipline in that sense. Mm. Um, I wanted to like punch and kick and flip. I didn't want to do kata. I didn't want to do any of those things. Um, so, um, I started training there for a bit and then, um, uh, gosh, I broke, ended up breaking my toe uh unrelated stuff stupid. Oh, okay <laughs> i used to be a i used to be a a breaker too when i was a kid so i, I broke my toe doing that and so i was um i was um, out for a little bit and then i came back and then when i came back we had we had the class had grown from like a really small maybe like five to seven people and we were in like the small rec rec the rec center room gosh when i came back uh to class it was like that scene from Enter the Dragon where it was like everybody's all punching in, in unison and doing this, yeah, yeah. And I was like, oh wow, this is it's different. Um class had grown. Yeah, it had. And I had I had grown too. Um mm -hmm. I had grown in ways where um I was I was the kid kind of like Jackie Chan a little bit, where when everyone is kind of doing what the instructors tell them to do, I'm over there making up my own moves and you know doing it by you know doing that kind of stuff so eventually we had to you know part ways in that sense so mm -hmm. so but what was it sounds like you started to find some things within martial arts in a class setting that resonated for you it sounds like it's the stuff that you saw in the movies the stuff that worked or at least helped you when you know things escalated beyond words and you're like okay i see something here that's kind of what what i'm piecing together yeah and i definitely like from that age from nine um i knew that i wanted to be um a martial arts instructor mm -hmm. i didn't know how i was going to get there you know because like i said i had just kind of i had just stepped away from the class but at that point in time i knew that that was something that i wanted to do like even even whatever what i learned I would share those things like I didn't I didn't just do that I didn't just do it in class like I took it home with me I shared what we were learning what I was learning with my friends uh just because I don't know I felt something and I felt it made me feel good to do that mm -hmm. uh something um motivated me to do that and I, I've known since I was nine like this is what I want to do I just didn't always know 
how I would go about doing it or, you know, what opportunities would present themselves. So, okay. so here you are nine years old, you're not training anymore, but you want to be a martial arts instructor. Yes. And I, 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 I am living it. And this is like, and I'm, this is my path, right? And this yeah. is not necessarily the path for everybody. Um, but this was my path. And so like, yeah, I, I stopped my formal training at that point in time. And I just, I just played. It just mm. was, it was a part of me. And like, I played. Um, what did that look like? That looked like, um, I, I think for most kids that don't like grow up in a culture where they have to be physical in that way, you have to teach them how to like punch, how to swing a stick, maybe how to kick. Um, but when you play at it, we're doing it so we're doing it so much mm. that it's like, and there's no one. It, it's like it's it's when when you watch children play. They play with this like intensity, um, completely enveloped in this world, right? Create this world and they're completely enveloped in this world. And you don't put it down. It becomes like part of your DNA. And so for me, it's like my identity as Damon and as a martial artist became fused as like one. So like, you know, um, I would punch, kick, flip, swing a stick, um, go through these adventures, whether it was with my friends or by myself. Um, I just played with the movements. And it wasn't always a very conscious thing. It was just something that was like um, um, just a form of uh, breathing for me, in a sense. Mm -hmm. um, the way you're talking about this reminds me of breaking culture in the 80s. Yeah, that's, that's that, exactly that you that. took that kind of methodology and applied it to combat. Yeah, that that is exactly. Uh, it was very, very, and to, to expand it out, just like hip hop is like that's kind of like sure. the the idea is like, you know, you 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 develop, you test yourself, you develop your style, you develop your expression of it, um, and it, for for those days, it was just like play. Um. Mm -hmm. Uh, eventually I had the, um, when eventually my next, our, we moved back to Texas and, um, then eventually we moved to Okinawa, Japan. And so when I got there, that was like the next, like transition and transformation for me. Um, how old were you when you made it to Okinawa? I was 13, okay. 13. So, so a few years later, but I, I would imagine the perfect age oh, yeah. boy who's in love with martial arts and has been kind of making a go of it on his own. And now you're in, you know, what some consider one of the hotbeds. Yeah, most definitely. And that's what I felt like. I like when I was there, like the, the total culture shock, like when you step off the plane, and it's like everything is is different from what you from what you've experienced and what you've known. The sights, the sounds, the people, uh, the writing, the energy. You know what I'm saying? Um, I live. I was fortunate. I'm really glad. I was fortunate to live off base uh, for about a year before um, we moved on base. Like living off base was like wonderful. Um, it was, it was in my head again, and I'm coming from a place of like, not just an activity or a sport, but like a world, you know what I'm saying? So like, I'm actually seeing stuff that I've seen like in the movies, even though these are different places and in my young mind, I'm seeing it as the same thing, but like, I'm actually feeling like I'm like there, there. So, um, Yeah. Uh, so it was like immersive in a lot of ways. Uh, my father, well, they only have like one at the time. They may have, this may have changed. They only had like one like American, like uh, television channel out there. And it was, you know, not really good. We got things probably about a a month behind everybody else or so. Um, so like a lot of families had these, these um, 
really, really extensive like VHS uh, movie collections, right? And that was a big business out there. It's like you can go, you could purchase like, um, you know, movies and stuff from shops and things. So my dad actually went to, he was there about a year and a half before we, we actually came and joined him. So he had this extensive collection of all these movies, like action movies, movies I would watch on Kung Fu Theater, you know what mm. I'm saying? All this stuff. It's like, and, and so like, I was just like in it, like just like in it. That's why I would watch the movies. And then like, I would like run around and walk around my neighborhood and just like, just like be there. Like it was, yeah. it was, um, uh, it was, yeah, it was, just, it was immersive in the, in that sense. Um, so yeah. Um, at that point in time, and just, I'm sorry, I'm just rambling on. No, no, keep going. Keep going. Yeah. So, you know, I'm 13. I'm at the height of puberty. You know, I look funny, sound funny. I'm in a new place. And, um, of course, you know, I'm, I'm raised basically by like action movies. So I, my interpersonal skills is like, well, yeah, you know, hey, clearly I'm the good guy. There's the girl. And then there's the bad guy, you know, so it's like real simple. So I, I'm thinking that the ladies like guys that can do really high jump kicks or random katas for no dang reason. Or, <laughs> you know, if only that had been true, I would have been much more popular in high school. Yeah, no. But um, so um, eh, gosh, in seventh grade, I spent a lot of time just being like a, a kind of a weird martial arts nerd. Mm-hmm. Um, and eighth grade, I decided like, hey, I'm gonna be a normal kid. I'm gonna like finally get a girlfriend and just be normal. Stop doing martial arts mm-hmm. and just be normal. Had anyone encouraged you to do that or did you come to that conclusion yourself? I came to that conclusion myself, right? And you know, hey, I'm normal kid, eighth grade. I got a girlfriend, great, holding her books, walking around, all this kind of stuff. But only problem is that, you know, she has a boyfriend, an ex-boyfriend who is not quite over her. Mm. And he has like lots of friends and... um you know, there was a potential that he was like, you know, going to, they were going to jump on me. And so like, man, I was, uh, (laughs) I learned about this and I was like, wow, man, I, you know, I was really trying to like, like montage myself into like fighting preparedness and um, just kind of realizing that, um, yeah, I couldn't do that. Uh, Fortunately, nothing really came of it but it did like awaken this need of like yeah i need to like get back into some type of um some type of training not just uh and i at that time i wasn't even like playing at it it was just like mm-hmm. i wasn't doing anything so um i went to the uh the uso on camp foster as a marine base and I signed myself up for the uh, Shorin Ru Karate classes taught by Isao Kisa, Kisei, excuse me. He's a son of Fuse Kisei um, mm-hmm. in Okinawa. And so, like, um, yeah, I began training Okinawa and Shorin Ru Karate uh, with him. And at that point in time, I was like, you know what, I'm going to try and be very serious in my, like, approach and in my, I'm going to learn kata. I'm going to just kind of go through and force myself to like embrace these other aspects that I didn't feel like I was interested in at the time. Hmm. And so keep going. Uh, How did it go? Keep going. It was great. You know, like I was, um, I was growing, I was getting stronger, getting more confident. Um, I mean, I I was like, I was um, Miguel Diaz and Cobra Kai in a sense, you know, that was, that Hmm. was, that was kind of (laughs) me. Um, um, rose, rose pretty quickly through the, through the ranks. Um, and then like, I kind of, I kind of hit this wall. Um, so a year, I'll go back a year before, like back when I was, um, just kind of playing around or whatever, I had, um, come across, uh, 
uh, the book, uh, book Miyamoto Musashi's book, Go to Show. And um, I read that, and it had like this really, it had it had this like profound effect on me when I first read it because I was looking for Lord of the Rings, right? And I was just doing like a the 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 card catalog search at the at the uh, Air Force Library, and then um, I came across um, Book of the Five Rings. I thought it was connected in some way. I found that it was like it had like it was that old school one with the where it's holding the two wooden Vulcan, and it was like all. Mm-hmm. Oh, this is not Lord of the Rings, but this is probably cooler. So I got it and I read it. And it was like I didn't I didn't understand everything that I was reading, but I was it was it was hitting me in certain ways. So fast forward about a year later, I stopped training and then I started back training and I'm I'm kind of growing in this art. And so I read this article. It was like a comparison between um the philosophies of Miyamoto Musashi and the philosophies of Bruce Lee. And um, when I was, in, when I read that article and I was introduced to uh, Bruce Lee's art, it kind of, it, 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 both of them had changed me how I viewed martial arts at the time. Uh, for one, um, with Musashi, uh, seeing the way in all ways um as the as a, a fighter martial artist swordsman or whatever um seeing seeing the way that that practice in all things you do was something that really spoke to me um especially like not always having access to formal training i had to train in a way that was very immersive also you know, um, a fighter should be not just skilled in the arts of war, but also should be skilled in the arts of poetry, calligraphy, um, tea ceremony, other activities, cultural activities, or um, that add this type of balance to, you know, the the other training. And so I saw martial arts as a form of, like, expression, like a... Mm-hmm. Uh, expression like an artistic expression as well uh then coming across bruce lee's philosophies of martial arts not just being like an expression of an art but it also being an expression of you like a personal expression of you um and that not we were not we are the same but we're not all the same Mm -hmm. um we have different attributes um different mentalities that and different ways and approaches to to like fighting and using fighting as a way of as a as a medium for expression uh we we have different different ways of going about that and there are different arts that add different elements to achieving those goals and that kind of like i know it's i know like a lot of martial artists like well not everybody's bruce lee and you can't create your own style and you can't do this and you can't do that and I didn't really have anyone to tell me that I couldn't do it. So I was, it, it, it planted this seed in me that like I wanted, and the karate training was great, you know what I'm saying? But like I wanted more. Um, I needed more uh, from what I was getting. And it wasn't, like I said, a deficiency from what I was learning. Mm-hmm. It's just like, there's more out there. Like I want to experience more. So I started to slowly uh dial back in my in my karate training and started to explore uh Jeet Kune Do. Mm-hmm. Um and that led me from so I'm I'm in eighth grade going into ninth grade. I think by the time I got into ninth grade I had fully like um I'm kind of more applying and, and adding into some of these these JKD concepts into my training. Um and then I'm at by ninth grade I stopped training Shore and Rue. Mm-hmm. And I'm independently training um with with JKD and you know whatever else. Uh and that became like my and again, so like my high school time period is always this like ebb and flow of like intense training and then like, okay, well I kinda like to have a social life and be not so crazy. So then I kind of dial back. And then there's something that comes that's like, oh, okay, well. You know, you got to deal with conflict, not necessarily dealing with conflict always with your fist, 
but you got to at least have something that helps you to stand up um, and uh, face challenges. You know, mm-hmm. like, not always just about punching or kicking someone, but having the ability to um, to do some things or having the having being familiar with being uncomfortable um, helps you in like dealing with someone in your face or dealing with someone who has a disagreement with you or wants to wants to punch you in the face because yeah. you're 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 inoculated to that in a sense and I and in many aspects in my high school time I had um, stopped training and then I had to start back but finally I finally it was kind of like a back and forth through high school it was always like part of my identity but it wasn't always something I was very intensely training like probably until junior year where I had like a breakthrough and it was like yeah this is like I'm I'm like I'm I'm full full in now and that was kind of what led me to kind of where I'm at now okay and well where where is that I know we'll go back <laughs> and we'll fill in some gaps but you kind of set me up for that question so I'll ask it mm. well so now where I'm at currently is um i am researching and reconstructing uh historical african martial arts Mm. um and that is like a culmination of my life trying to figure myself out as a martial artist and as a person of african descent living in the united states of Mm. america oh there you go nice wow (laughs) And cool. yeah, also as a as a sword maker. And you still love swords. Still love swords, yeah. You made that. I actually my, my business partner it? my business okay. partner made it. Okay. Um oh. this is what we do. We make we make swords. Um that's a whole nother story as well. We'll get into that. Yeah, yeah, we'll, um, we'll get there. Um so yeah, so like it's this culmination of these two parts of me uh that have come together. Um my love for history was uh, birthed by necessity. Mm-hmm. Um, at the time, uh, not really having a lot of access to like African history, um, and that kind of creating this like void. Mm-hmm. And like you know, like I said, I I freely um, consumed um, martial culture in various forms of media, movies, you know, cartoons, books at some times. And it was always like uh, Asian or it was always European and um, never connected Africa and people that looked like me to those pictures, to those, mm-hmm. to those, um, to those, to that, that world concept of a, of a warrior protector or whatever else. And that has always been something I had struggled with uh, my identity in that sense. Um, it wasn't until my uh, eighth grade teacher in Okinawa. So o- Okinawa was a big, a big <laughs> transform transformation, transformative uh, place for me. Uh, she was the first person to teach me uh, to share, to open my eyes to the many like African empires and kingdoms that existed, you know, in the past. And again, it's always like it's it it it's a, a seed that's been planted, and it doesn't always just spring just in that moment. It's usually like she gave me names that stayed here, and then a few years later, you know, when I was when I had access to you know uh, look up information to when I there was this hunger for it, I had those names to use as my reference points, and that kind of like you know, spread into this, like, love of uh, African history and eventually, like, the history of enslaved Africans in the diaspora. Uh, so now that stuff is kind of, like, growing on one side, and my martial arts is kind of growing separately on this side. Mm. Um, as I'm um, exploring Jeet Kune Do, I started to gravitate more towards the Jeet Kune Do concepts that's kind of been like spearheaded by like Dan and Asanto. And of course, it's like heavily um, a, a large influx of Southeast Asian martial arts. Um, 
which really struck me as very different when I uh, started seeing things like Muay Thai, uh, Kali, and Silat. Um, it was a very different aspect of of, of Asian martial arts um, experiencing those. There was something that was like not just um, like it was not just like the the arts as an art, which it was that, or it wasn't even as it wasn't just the arts as how they function, but it was also like art the the martial art itself as being an expression of culture. Mm. Um, the incorporation of music and like dance and um, and I'm not saying that this is not the case in the art in in uh, karate or kung fu or you know the Korean practices, but it seemed a lot more evident um, in Southeast Asian cultures. So having experiencing experiencing that is what really primed me for like African martial arts because mm. the world was getting like the world was getting smaller and what was considered martial art. And that's what, you know, Jeet Kune Do itself is what opened that up for me because, you know, Bruce was dabbling not just in Chinese arts and not just in, like, you know, Asian martial arts, but he was bringing in, like, boxing and wrestling and fencing, um, you know, Western yeah. European arts into into his, into his training understanding. And so... Um, you know, so it's like, well, martial arts is not just a East Asian thing. It's a, it's an, it's a. You see it in East Asia and Southeast Asia, and then in, in in South Asia, India, and then it's also part of Europe. You know, you see it in, you know, boxing and fencing and wrestling. Mm -hmm. It's not even going into the historical reconstruction stuff that we see today. And so it always left me wondering: is like, well, like it'd be. I wonder if there was anything that was like practiced in um, in Africa. Mm. Um, and so in 1993, 94, I got my answer. My gateway into the African arts uh, came in the form. Um, shout out to uh, Sifu Mark Dacascus and Mestre Amin Santos for um, uh, being in uh, Only the Strong. I was wondering uh, if that's where you're gonna go. Oh yeah, that it changed. It changed my life. That changed my life. Like that was like, and I didn't even realize like what it was what was happening, um, because we had seen Capoeira before, um, in a movie called Rooftops. Seen it before. I'm not familiar. Rooftops. Yeah, you're gonna have to. Yeah, this. I'm gonna I'm gonna write that down. Write it down. <laughs> oh yeah, Rooftops and Mighty Quinn, and to be honest, in Kung Fu, the in um David Carradine's Kung Fu. Been a long time. I'm yeah, 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 trust you on that. Please yeah, continue. So I, yeah, so yeah. I graduated high school in '93, and I had no idea what I was like going to do with myself. And so I had a an extended gap year, um, where I was trying to figure stuff out. And while I was like free, I was about that martial arts life. You know, I was um. Um, I got really, really heavy, heavily, heavy into Japanese sword. Mm. Um, crazy. So um, still doing everything else. Uh, for me, when I first saw Capoeira, there was something that really drew me to it. Um, I didn't understand what I was seeing. Um, I didn't understand the art and the movie didn't really explain the art, like we accepted the art because of the like the authentic display of it, you know, the display of it, you know, um, throughout the movie, or at least like you know, not talking about the fight scenes per se, but like the the display the display of it from the onset. So um, it left a lot of questions for me, like you know, what is this art? Like, tell me, you know, want to know more about it? Um, seeing people that look like me, you know defy gravity in that way mm -hmm. um like it was it spoke to me you know yeah i used to be a breaker too so like mm -hmm. i saw a lot of similarity in those movements and i could never dance i was like i'm never a good dancer but i was like wow it's like i was like you know i was out there and piling out weighing it and throwing kicks and not understanding what i was doing but i was doing i didn't have anyone to tell me like no but um as a kid, as a young person, even as an adult, 
if there's something that I want to learn, like I'll go, I go after it and um, I try to figure it out. If I don't have a lot of information, like I work with, I work with what I have. And uh, through my, through my pursuits, uh, spent a lot of time in bookstores with my mom and libraries with my mom. Um, I came across some like books on the subject of capoeira and I started to like learn about the art um, and its history. And um, that really is like what like opened me up to uh, to where I'm at today. Mm -hmm. You know, so sim it pretty much it answered the question for me that there's this there's this fighting art that's practiced in Brazil that is supposed to be based off of other fighting arts that came from West and Central Africa. And not only that, there are a plethora of fighting arts that are similar to this fighting art practiced throughout the Caribbean, uh, practiced throughout South America, practiced in, even in North America. Um, there's something here. There is this greater, there is this, there, during this horrific event of, you know, forced migration of millions mm -hmm. of people, when these people crossed the Atlantic, they didn't lose their culture. I and mean, this was like the narrative that I felt, you know, when I was younger. And even when I was like studying, starting to study African history, I felt that like, yeah, I want to focus just on, you know, the time before colonialism, before slavery, uh, because I felt like we had lost so much, you know, when when we had crossed. Mm -hmm. um, when I when I started to delve into the origins of capoeira and like seeing some of his cousin arts and just like getting a different narrative to how enslaved people navigated um, slavery and colonialism. Um, the, you know, I think I heard someone say existence is resistance in a sense, you know what I'm saying? Like survive, like live. And some people found that the best way to combat these things was to be able to like survive, to live. Some people found ways to live and disguise what they practice, um, disguise these things so that it would survive. Some people said, hell no, I can't live like this. We don't, shouldn't live like this. And they physically stood up and fought, you know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? And these are all ways of, of resistance. And these are all ways that have their time and their place. Um, but just knowing that there were alternate narratives out there and that it wasn't always the case of, you know, just, you know, uh, just being in a position of weakness, you know, yeah? it's like, I didn't like feeling that way. So uh, Capoeira really opened me up to like the different ways that um, enslaved Africans um, resisted mm -hmm. uh, slavery and took, took mastery over their bodies um, through the practices of this art. Um, and, you know, even, you know, like from in, in all these degrees of like, um, whether it's like open revolts or if it's like, you know, Brazilian culture is like, you know, Afro-Brazilian culture is Brazilian culture. You know what I'm saying? It's like, it's one of the, the it has like the largest um, number of people of African descent in many, many African nations. And so um, I'm not saying any of that is perfect, but, you know, it just opened my eyes up to the different ways that, you know, different stories. Sure. So um, by seeing all that that was happening in the diaspora, the next question, the next logical question, solution for me was like well what are the parent arts to these things and then that led me you know to researching continental arts so now i would imagine that that you know if we're, we're doing the math here you're talking about coming out of high school in 93 mm -hmm. and you know from from my vantage historical european martial arts that that work you, you use the word reconstruction didn't really happen until the internet got bigger right there were people doing it but it was just it was so so niche yeah i 
I would imagine you found the same challenge. How do yeah. you how do you put these pieces together when they're scattered and let's face it, um, you know there aren't a whole lot of people asking the question. Well, if martial arts existed everywhere, which I think we can all agree, if anywhere mm -hmm. that, that there might have been more than a few people, there was probably going to be some fighting, and somebody was going to be smart enough to say, "Well, maybe if I get better at fighting, I won't die." Right. What did their fighting arts look like versus their fighting arts? Yeah. Uh, and over the last few years of this show, we've had the opportunity to hear a lot of these stories. Right. Uh, but I'm I'm curious what what your early explorations into you, you called them colonial. Yeah. Is that what I heard you say? Colonial. Um. What was the word you were using for the parent arts for capoeira? No, no, no. The uh, what did I use? I don't remember the exact term. I That's okay. That's okay. It'll, it'll, it'll come to me. Talk about um, that early research you were doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, it, it's the same. It's like as you described. Like I got to a point where I had, I was doing research both in the early phases of of the internet, and then I was doing a lot of book book research as well, mm -hmm. and then a lot of. Um, interviews and asking and talking to people mm -hmm. so we're, we're right now probably at 1997 98 um i'm um on ut the university of texas uh mm -hmm. campus and i'm uh I, I start off there actually with the um, the african students association and oh okay let me back up sure let me back up so Capoeira, and then um, I come across a few. So I come across a few videos and articles about uh, African-Americans who were researching and doing African martial arts. Mm -hmm. um, and that led me primarily to like the work of uh, Kalindi E. He's, he's passed away. Um, fairly recently and what really struck me about his movements is you know mind you and i'm also coming from like a southeast asian uh background um at this time the use of weapons because you know, in karate like you couldn't touch weapons like until you got to like a certain phase sure but in like silat or in kali you know you're picking up weapons in the in the beginning so i like yeah. The emphasis on using weapons, uh, which he demonstrated, like, you know, the use of, like, you know, uh, stick fighting, um, wooden weapons that were, like, spears and, you know, war clubs and things of that nature. And using these things in the training. Um, and so I'm like, wow, you know, this is, like, really cool. Like, you know, Capoeira was one thing. Um but then seeing this, I was like, oh, okay, this is really like, okay. You know, you know, for Capoeira, it's like, it's, as a, as a martial artist, you know, fighting is kind of part of what, the th what we, we do, whether that's like for fun or just for the exploration or for the personal challenge or whatever else. So like, I was still figuring out how Capoeira felt, fit in to, um, as a, as a fighting art. I'm still figuring it out for myself. Mm. Um, and initially, that's what, if I backtrack a little bit, what really made me make the connections um, is seeing the move, the, the commonality of movements between Capoeira and like Silat and mm. like Ali um, in certain aspects. So that it kind of made me, you know, gravitate to it or at least like seeing it outside of it's like outside of um traditional play traditional um you know the expression of it right um just talking about it as like a fighting art um and so what i liked about what uh Clinty was showing was like it was lots of it was weapons training it was like weapons based uh it was a, a wrestling component to it as well as striking and so um I got his videos and reached out to him 
and he was demonstrating like uh, Zulu stick fighting. He was demonstrating uh, long stick from uh, Egypt. And then he was doing, um, you know, his empty hand stuff that was based off of wrist knife fighting. And so well, what he was doing, there was like, a, there were, and there was like also movements that were like encoded into the dance, into traditional dances. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was very intriguing, you know, to me. Yeah. Um, that that um that approach, and so I I kind of like again I I I follow up on those leads, um looking into um in Guni stick fighting as little stick fighting, uh arts like Tahtib, which is where the 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 Nambut, the the stick practices that he was using was coming from, um and you can find what we call like living traditions today. It's like you know cultures that have maintained. Um, or revive their their fighting mm -hmm. arts, um, and so um, I would do research trying to find those roots because he you no. Know, so I'll say this: so with Africa is a very large place, right? Um, a very large, very dynamic place. And the issue I came across when trying to like find African martial arts is actually the words I'm using, right? Mm -hmm. Um, if I say African martial arts, especially then, and I'll go to the university and I'll talk to people who come from Nigeria or, or, or anywhere else, they're like, you know, African martial arts, what are you talking about? What do you mean? I wasn't using the right words. I wasn't, I wasn't framing it in a way to get, you know, information. I needed to be mm -hmm. more, I'm using it as an American using the term martial arts. I should be using more specific terms like, well, is there any type of wrestling? Is there any type of, you know, things like that? And more specific stuff. You can get better answers that way. But I had to learn that by through talking to people. Um, okay. uh, case in point, yeah. so I did, I did this demonstration for the um, African Students Association um, after, like, being inspired by Clint E's videos and then, like, my time with Capoeira and kind of, like, this opening this dialogue about African martial arts and um for the most part it was it was well received um many people didn't really have any much to contribute but through that dialogue like I met a student who was a he was from Togo mm -hmm. and he was a he was actually writing a paper on Togolese wrestling uh called uh, a wrestling festival called Ivala and um, the comparison between Togolese wrestling and, you know, wrestling arts like judo. Um, and he came and taught some stuff and demonstrated some stuff uh, to me in my class. And so it was that kind of like uh, synergy that I found. Sometimes it would yield things like that. Sometimes it would yield only a word or a description or nothing. But that was the way of it, you know, so it was between talking to people, interacting with people, uh, finding sources online, mm -hmm. then like reading um, books on this, on the subject where I started to get a little bit of momentum. But I started mm -hmm. to, at the time, lean more heavily into Capoeira. Um, and then, of course, as the world became more connected, it created more opportunities to make connections. Where where did you go from there? I, I would imagine at this point you have far more questions than answers, mm. and you know it, it. It sounds like you're you're spending time with Capoeira almost because you don't know where else to spend it. Yeah, it, I I had a um, I had a friend who who helped me like put our Capoeira group together, and um, and we were both like fans of Clint E's work and we were like yeah so let's like we're gonna focus we'll focus on Capoeira uh Zulu stick fighting and uh Tahtib those three were like the most accessible um that we could do hmm. and then eventually the emphasis became more on Capoeira and partially because I feel like Capoeira's success um, in the world has 
actually made it possible, not just for me to do what I'm doing now, but I think that Capoeira's success has allowed for other arts in the African diaspora to like gain momentum locally. Sure. Um, many of these arts at that time and before were, um, you know, pretty close to extinction in many aspects. And then you see like this, this revital revitalization that happens. And I, and I do believe that Capoeira, again, being as popular as being as widespread helped to say, you know, oh, well, there is Capoeira here, but there's an art that's very similar to it that's practiced in this little island called Martinique called Damier. And it's like, oh, wow, they do punching, kicking, um, sweeps, headbutts, throws, grappling, standing, and on the ground. Wow. And then so you're like, you know, it, it adds this, this forward push, just like mm -hmm. hunger that feeds into the development and the revitalization of these art forms. So I really think Capoeira fueled this this current state that, state that we're in. Um, yeah. I knew I that there was more out there, um, but again, not always having like the access to it and Capoeira being more accessible. Um, that's where I put a lot of my attention um, into, you know, as things started to, you know, again, the they say the teacher, the, when a student's ready, the teacher appears. So it was it was constantly a mat a case of that where I'm actively training in Capoeira, mm -hmm. uh, trying to keep up my weapon skill, but again, putting a lot of focus in on Capoeira. But at that time, your your weapons skill was primarily Japanese, right? Is well, I had so let me go back. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I had stopped focusing on Japanese uh, sword. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it, it okay. <laughs> I should yeah fill this in. They're like, I knew it. <laughs> He's a kinjutsu guy. No, no, no. So I went through a, about a year of like this intense bushido kinjutsu phase. Mm -hmm. It was it was pretty crazy. I don't know, probably write a movie about it. Um. And then I, um, I mean, I was, I was like pretty bad. Like I was like serious about it. Like in a very, uh, yeah, like I, I would carry my Vulcan around. Like I was pretty, I was pretty damn serious about this. <laughs> and then I think that like, after about a year of doing that, I was like, well, how practical is it for me? Like, is, you know, like, I mean, am I really waiting for ninjas to jump out from the forest and, <laughs> my my book and I was real serious about my stuff but so I started to um I I stopped training um I stopped practicing kinjitsu and that kind of gave way into like uh the 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 Kali scream of the knife the knife and the more more the knife than it was a stick because then I could carry a knife around sure. which then I got into dune and then it's like Framing and carrying knives. It was like it was just like this thing that kind of like you know kept me going. So by that how, time, how many knives were you carrying? Uh, you know, I... <laughs> <laughs> this this is something I've only recently learned among Filipino martial arts practitioners is that you, you you can never carry just one knife. Yeah, yeah. Like I, they there was this there was this store, these two stores. The internet like internet uh sales uh killed these stores. They were like um, they were like. It was a martial arts studio with multiple. It was a perfect setup, to be honest. Mm. Martial arts studio with multiple rooms teaching multiple arts. Oh, cool. There was a. I know. It was like there was a. There was a. a there was a. Um, a bag area where you can just pay a flat rate a month and just work on the bags. Right. It had a storefront. The sold weapons, mm -hmm. videos. Uh. Gear, 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 and geese and stuff like that. It, it was a, it was a perfect set. I, I would like to see those kinds of things come back. Yeah, me too. So, um, yeah. So they would, they would sell, <laughs> they would sell knives to the kids to us. <laughs> and I, yeah, I was, you know, seventeen, eighteen. Probably shouldn't have been walking around with some of these, but they were like, you know, I had all these like really exotic swords and stuff, and uh, we would go get our knives and stuff from them. But um, 
Yeah, I had. I think I had at that time just just one knife I was carrying okay. with. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wasn't that deep into it. I, there was a point in time when I was like, I have to have seven weapons on me and all. <laughs> you know, I had a, had a knife and I had a. You know, I have my hair back. I wore this like little spike. Oh yeah. My hair. I had a chain. It was like I was. I don't know what was going on with it. But You're ready yeah, to go. I was ready to go. Um. So yeah. Um. I from that point, yeah, I had I had was was favoring the knife over over the sword, just kind of out of this like this practicality, you know, of being able to carry it, and that's kind of where my sh- my shift and focus went. Um, and I think, and I don't really think I honestly started to like carry a blade until like I was like maybe like nineteen is when I was like. I, I had a, a small little blade, little fixed blade, um, that I would carry. But yeah, my my basically my focus had 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 shifted from uh the katana to like something shorter and close and stuff. I felt that that was more more practical. Um, right. you know, again, not that I'm getting into knife fights and like you know whatever else, but in my mind, that's what I was. That's where yeah, I. It's a lot easier to. Yeah. carry a, a, a three four five inch blade than to carry a sword you walk down the street with a sword and people are gonna call the cops yeah well now in texas it's perfectly legal they're still gonna call the cops they are still gonna call the cops true but uh yeah so and i think i'm, I'm trying to go back it's a little fuzzy sometimes for me it's okay um, at that time, I was trying to adapt um, the uh, the stick and si- the stick and shield method of uh, Zulu stick fighting, and then like the long stick work that was from Tahtib, um, which uh, Kalindi was, uh, you know. So many of these practices they they are, they occur, like, and it that, that goes back to what I was trying to say earlier, but I think I went around the world and circle back here. So um, going back to like how we define martial arts and what we expect from martial arts as a pro martial art as like Americans or even as like coming from outside of the culture. Um, some of these combat sports, these warrior traditions, they happen for very specific reasons, right? Mm-hmm. It's not quite like, you know, say that you are, um, you're, a, you know, from the Suri tribe in Ethiopia, right? They're renowned as stick fighters they fight with these really really long sticks and they're pretty hardcore you know um the the, the, har- the fighting is pretty hardcore you know it's mm. not uncommon for you know limbs to be broken and things of that nature but the suri don't use at least like today nowadays they don't use stick fighting for self-defense they do it for a very specific what's that Yes, AK forty seven. That's what they right. use self defense now. Thank you, Jay. <laughs> He's right though. Yeah, they have yeah. conflicts with other people, and they're using they're using using guns. They're um, not bringing a stick to a to a gunfight. No, not at all. So that form of stick fighting exists within that particular time frame, that particular ritual for that particular people, sure. and so each each ethnic group will have a specific type of fight. Uh, Dambe boxing, for example, you know, it is from Nigeria, um, is specifically practiced by how, by the house of people in Northern Nigeria. And um, it's, it's their cultural practice. So a guy, a Dambe boxer may not use Dambe boxing if they get into a fist scuffle. I'm sure mm-hmm. it helps in certain aspects, but it's not the same way that, it's not the same way that we're viewing it. This is not to say that there aren't some arts that are like that, because again, we're talking a bit about a very, very large and diverse um, uh, group of people and a very large and diverse, you know, practice. So mm-hmm. they're not all all the same. Uh, typically, with with African martial arts, we notice um, that they function on a on a on a societal level. To whether that's to like, um, uh, I should say, not just to like train people to be fighters, but also like as a source of entertainment, 
mm -hmm. um, as a means to uh, celebrate certain like uh, rites of passages, to celebrate or commemorate the ancestors of certain spiritual, celestial alignments and things like that. Depending on the culture, this is the significance of some of these activities. So like as a, even though I'm of African descent, when I do like Suri stick fight, it doesn't have the same, the same cultural significance to me because I'm looking at it as, I'm not looking at it as this is what I'm going to do in order to like prove my bravery and demonstrate my skill and be able to like gain access to choose my wife. That's not why I'm doing it. I'm would do Suri stick fighting. So, oh, I have a long stick tradition that I can draw from. That means I can play with other martial artists that fight with similar weapons. Mm -hmm. You know, or if I needed to, or if I wanted to use it as like a, a means of self defense, um, I could. So, like my my using it is is a little different. Um, and so like there's that, there is that, that kind of understanding that has to be, we have to come to that kind of understanding when we are, um, exploring these arts is that they take place in a very, very specific, you know, mm. specific way. Um, and so, uh, that raises different questions for people who are looking for African martial arts, um, and how you go about doing that like uh, you know it is it is a question that we're still as a as the african martial arts community is still trying to like answer and then some people take you know very very hard lines one way or, or the other on like how it should be done and what it and what should be done shocker uh, yeah right it's subject to the martial arts with hard lines yeah and my my way is to be as open and honest um as possible with with who I am and with what I do, um, and in being open and honest with the material, um, if I'm doing, you know, like I, I have a mentor and a and a teacher in uh, Algerian stick fighting, a mathrag, and I'm very clear. Each one of these things has its own. I, I say traditional, but I, I mean uh, traditional is not the right word, but I'll say cultural um, way that it's like. And I use the term played. Hmm. Um, so it has its 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 cultural way that it's played uh, or performed or fought that exists within inside that particular mm -hmm. culture. It would mm -hmm. be like in karate doing the same system, like maybe one step sparring or particular katas. This is within those systems. Um, what I'm doing is two things. I want to preserve the practice as I've received it, paying respect to the way that I've received it. Mm -hmm. At the same time, I want to be able to do that on one end, successfully and faithfully do that. On the other end, I want to be able to take it and explore with other people that are outside of this 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 realm so mm. with this stick fighting tradition i can you know because it, it was a it was a means of training and preparing soldiers to use uh, use sabers and swords and things of that nature so i can now i can take these skills and i can interact with other people that fight with sabers or other people that fight with medium link sticks or mm. people that do different arts I'm now able to say, oh, this is a skill set that I've learned from Mathrag, and I'm coming to explore and interact with you guys that are doing this Kima Saber tournament. Mm. So, um, or if I'm, you know, going to enter into a Gianfa, you know, sword tournament, I will take those skills and explore my sword stick skills with people that do Gian, the Gian fighting and that allows me to interact and to expose you know one myself and get that feel as a martial because as a martial artist I don't want to I I want to be I want to have my root but I don't want this is me speaking mm -hmm. as a martial artist 
I want to have my root, but I also want to be able to like expand, you know, yeah. beyond my root. And yeah, so this you're... is my way to do that. At the same time, if I um if I make a good showing of myself, if I fight with honor, if I fight well, then it's like, oh well, what what are you doing? What what system is that? What are you training? And then I'm this is this is what I do. This is where this comes from. And then it's like, oh, I never knew that this existed. And then there's this like exchange and this dialogue yeah. that happens. And that is what I'm that is what I'm trying to do. Mm, uh, I love it. I love I love hearing that. I I love that you're you're I've talked to very few people who feel strongly about doing both the preservation of how it was given to them for historical and or cultural and or respectful, you know, whatever reasons, but also allowing it to exist in a separate way. You know, you got one and the other, and this one over here can morph and change and grow and, you know, become something else. And yeah. I, I, I've always appreciated that dichotomy because when it happens, it quote solves all the problems. Right, we yeah. can still have this. I can right. show you the way that I was taught my katas growing up in karate, but I can also show you how I adjusted them when I took them into competition. Yeah, and and I think that that's what that is the that is the dilemma that martial artists find ourselves in is like honoring tradition, but also realizing that like life fighting is dynamic and chaotic it's not static and we can always have our roots we can always have our traditions we can always have our source but um we can also you know fulfill and, that, and that's been my thing is like I, there's a there is a desire in me to like have and know that this tradition existed and to be fed by it. Mm. At the same time, there's also this need in me to like, um, you know, find myself in this larger, in this larger world to be like a, a living, breathing, um, you know, martial artist. You know what I'm saying? Um, and that that is the challenge I, I get um, sometimes from, um, uh, uh, and I've had, and I'm very blessed to have very few. Um, you know, critics in that sense. Mm -hmm. But I think that that's one thing they don't understand about me is that even with Capoeira, you know, and I'm I'm sorry, I'm bouncing back and forth. It's okay. Even in Capoeira, when we see Capoeira play today, if we if we just say, oh, this is Capoeira, this is the way that it was done since it was created, it's never changed, it's never evolved, it's never adapted. It looks exactly the same. It's been perfectly preserved now from back then. Mm. And like that's that's like that's that's not true. Um it 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 has changed. And so when you get people who kind of see it in that way, and this is not just for Capoeira, and then you say something like, Well, I want to explore how like I hear all these stories about these guys who would fight against the, you know, the armed police, the military police, you know, in the, the 1900s, all these like, you know, these these guys that, you know, this guy was legendary Capoeirista who could fight, you know, 10, 10 guys, 10 armed guys that didn't disappear, you know, like, I, like, I know that that part is not true, that him turning into like a beetle and disappearing is not true, but like, there had to have been some substance to this story or like when um the 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 merc the the hessian and irish mercenary battalions in rio revolted because they weren't getting paid correctly the the government in rio who had been persecuting like darth vader style jedi persecuting capoeiristas they weren't persecuting them because they were turning flips and singing songs and disguising their fighting art as a dance. They were persecuting and, and imprisoning them, killing them, uh, exiling them, and practicing their art because they felt that it was a physical threat to mm -hmm. it was a, they were like paramilitary groups in a sense. So um 
the city of Rio um, called in the capoeiristas to fight against the 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 uh, Hessian and 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 Irish um, mercenaries hmm. uh, in the city. Then they saved the city from from these two groups. And so, like, how is a how is a I mean, there's many ways it could happen, but how is a, a group of people who aren't practicing a a a legitimate fighting art, how are they able to contend against, you know, a mm-hmm. modern time military, you know, you know, well-trained military organization? And, you know, so like it hearing those kinds of stories, it's like, well, okay, well, how does how do we how do we do this? Like, how does it look? Mm. Now? Like, you know, like, what does that look like? So even coming from that kind of perspective is like, um, oh yeah, you're kind of like, you're breaking tradition. You're violating tradition. You're not, you're, you're adding like foreign influences. You're doing this and you're doing that. And like, no, I'm, I'm really just trying to understand like how, if you, and if you say that these are the arts that were practicing the Quilombos when they were fighting against, the Portuguese and the Dutch well how like tell you know what is this you know what is it how does it look like how does yeah. it look when it's, when it's done that way and so just kind of coming out the box in that kind of way it's like you know you get uh criticism and stuff and I've just come to accept that that's this is just my path here here's how I look at it and I I don't know if you've ever thought about it this way all all fighting arts and the easiest place to see this is in competition. All fighting arts end up being somewhat specialized towards whatever the rules are. Okay, right. so if you take out the rules, what are the rules? The rules are the terrain, the height of the person. Are you fighting one-on-one or group-on-group? Group or are you being ambushed or are you ambushing? What right. are the weapons that are involved? Yes. Um, are you fighting during the day or at night? Those parameters are going to exist regardless. So mm-hmm. if I take taekwondo and i try to understand taekwondo from actually it's a bad example because there's a book if i try to take karate you know some okinawan flavor of karate Mm -hmm. from however long ago and try to understand it as best i can i need to mimic the environment i need to have similar styles of training and Mm -hmm. dietary concerns right because certain things work when you're bigger and more muscled that right. don't work when you're on the verge of starvation. Right. And so when people say, well, no, that you're you're corrupting it by trying to inject these other things, I see it as let me try to understand it from the inside and the outside. And it makes right. complete sense to me because if you are being true to the historical elements, those parameters, right. you're gonna have a better understanding. Oh, okay, well, they wouldn't have done this because of right. instead right. of saying, no, there's no way that these people could have thought of doing a kick in this way or a punch in this way. It's, to me, that's incredibly arrogant when people make that criticism. Right, right, exactly. Yeah, I, and I think that's what I enjoy about where I'm at now is like I feel more like a, I feel more like a, like a scientist in a sense. Mm. That like, you know, even just, um, what it takes to kind of get like a rough idea of like what this could have possibly be done. It involves like one, my body, getting my body, making my body prepared um, to do what I think that they were doing. Right. So, so take, for example, let's say I'm when one of the things I work on is like Egyptian uh, martial arts. No, there are no books on it. <laughs> There's no living traditions of ancient Egyptian martial arts. Um, Tati probably being the closest in in Egypt itself, but so I know that I know that um, Egyptian soldiers they practice stick fighting, multiple modalities of stick fighting. Uh, they fought with shields, they mm-hmm. fought with weapons. Uh, they wrestled, they practiced archery, they ran. Um, this is the thing that they that they did. So part of getting my body together is doing those things, you know what I'm saying? Doing my size, preparing those things. I may not have all the answers of what it looked like, but I can prepare my body for the task. I know that if I have to carry a shield, 
I should probably have some kind of facsimile of a shield that I can like practice with to develop the strength and mm -hmm. muscles to be able to do that. If they're swinging, you know, cutting, smashing, percussive instruments um, like maces, axes, um, and slashing swords, then I know that those, I know the activities that I need to do. Outside of that, I'm looking at a lot of like art. I'm looking at um, iconography. I'm looking at statuaries, um, both mm -hmm. uh, from the time period and um, from also from contemporary cultures that have either been influenced or may have influenced the culture that I'm studying. Mm -hmm. I'm also looking at living traditions that are still practiced in the areas, in the immediate areas that are like, um, you know, close to to where the Egyptians were. Um, the the Nuba people in Sudan, I think that they have like a martial culture that closely resembles those of Pharaonic Egypt. The Nuba are renowned as wrestlers. Mm -hmm. They have um, uh, uh, various forms of stick fighting. Uh, most notably is they do stick fighting with a strap shield on the forearm, like a like a like a, a plank on the forearm, and a medium link stick is is like it's it's, it's almost yeah. a parallel for you know Middle Kingdom stick fighting um, at the time. Uh, so, and I'm looking at you know these contemporary living traditions that are still practiced in Africa or in the Middle East, and this is like allowing me to like kind of like narrow down i'm looking also at there like i said there's no um there are no manuals no books on egyptian martial arts or how to use a kopesh but there is a very detailed um surgical manual on how to treat like people that have suffered very traumatic wounds so mm -hmm. and a lot of the wounds are like pierced being you know stabbed by spears or by swords and things like that so, like i'm doing this whole forensic yeah Oh, really reading. cool. And at the end of the day, I'm not going to say, well, this is the art that was taught by, you know, Thutmosis the fifth, you know, and it was passed down to me and so and so and so and so. No, I'm like, this is what I'm doing. This is the best reconstruction that I can do based off of me preparing my body to be able to deliver, preparing my mind by by becoming very, very acquainted with Egyptian military traditions being very acquainted with Egyptian weapons, defensive gear, what mm. their contemporaries were using and doing at the same time, and what living evidence we might have uh, from living traditions around the area, or people that have, or cultures that have similar tech as like the, the Egyptians did at the time. And like, you know, I'm, I'm counting on being wrong. And that's okay because it's going. It's like it's always something new that adds to it, and I'm always constantly learning. Um, I'm constantly growing. I'm never like the master in that sense. I'm always like a very avid um, student, and I, mm. I, I I like that. Nice. But we're gonna start to wind down. I want to make sure that we talk about your swords, though, because I know that this is still a passion of yours. It throws back to the very first thing you talked about. What's what's going on with swords and what would possess someone to invest time in making and testing swords? Say that part one more time. I'm being harassed right now. Lamar. <laughs> you, sure look, look like, you sure look like a master to me. Oh, my God. Well, <laughs> that was a reference to, to The Last Dragon. My friends are goofy. Sorry. Uh, no, it's <laughs> we we it's a good thing you have goofy friends. I clearly, clearly. So uh, what was your question one more time? You you invest a lot of time into sorts, just in all the ways that one could invest time in, right? Yeah, yeah. Researching, understanding, training with, making. And I imagine that there's some parallels there with the research that you're doing as well. So I, I want to make sure we talk about that before we wrap yeah, up Yeah, most definitely. So um, one thing I really, one thing that I really love and left this really lasting impression on me is when I was in Okinawa and I would go visit the different dojos, I enjoyed seeing the different kobudu weapons, uh, the oars, the the boken, the tonfa, all that stuff. So when I would go in, I would see like these racks 
of all these wooden weapons. And I really, I really like seeing that. Um, and then like seeing the Kung Fu movies, seeing all the different weapons on display had this, um, this impression on me. Um, and I'm kind of going through it fast. Musashi making his making his sword out of an ore mm-hmm. had like this 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 deep impression on me. And then um seeing Kalindi E demonstrate uh Zulu stick fighting with a wooden spear, these were all things that like made me like want to like well, I should say before that, rewind all that. In the past, we made weapons to play with. We made wooden swords, swords out of scrap pieces of metal, swords out of like plastic, swords out of like whatever material we could find around us became like, you know, swords. So this was something that was in me as a young, young person. Um, and it just like in those those moments, the the idea was like, oh wow, you can you can take this and you make it and look like this it just started to like grow and to um be a side passion a side love of mine when we and there was a couple of times so like my my uh business partner we all are in this like uh stage combat fight choreography group called cry havoc and so uh these guys were like ahead of their time i was i'm the baby in the group i'm the oldest but i'm the baby in the group i'm the youngest person i'm the youngest member of the group mm-hmm. Uh, so they were like doing these like these crazy like dystopian fantasy plays, you know, in theater, making their own weapons and stuff. Mm. And so when we all clicked up together, then it's like it just started to like you know steamroll. So we we went through several, and we we met like in the early like um, ninety seven ninety eight when we all kind of connected. So like over the years, we would try to like we would make different different weapons for stage or for you know for use or whatever else. Um, right around the time when I was doing this, uh, the starting to research um, African weaponry, it was probably like in uh, two thousand nine. We uh, we had a breakthrough, um, and we started to make. Um, and this is about about when HEMA came on my on my um, uh, uh, radar, and so we started making some wooden swords at first. Where we got some made for us for our group, we were doing more sword work, more machete work, more stick work with my group. We were, you know, again focusing at first primarily on capoeira, and then I started to, you know, introduce some of these machete arts and some of these sword dances, like Tuareg style sword dances. Um, so. Maybe about maybe about three years after that, about 2012, when I was like, yeah, like we're gonna go, you know, heavy. I had I had I had injured my my knee. Mm. Uh, I couldn't do capoeira anymore the way that I used to do it, and so I had to like shift my focus into weapons. And when I did that, uh, that was when we started to like we saw that there were um that. Uh, certain groups were using like synthetics like nylon or HTPE in order to like have like, you know, because the HEMA organ- the HEMA community, they were looking for things to get themselves as close as they could sure. to like, you know, the the real thing. And so like, I really like that approach of being able to like create these facsimiles that would, and in some cases, especially like with African swords being so like um, in many cases, being very, very um, exotic in their shapes. Not all of them. I don't want to, you know, feel that 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 misunderstanding that all African swords are like these really super, super exotic and shaped weapons. But uh, there are some very, very interesting weapons that, like, the shape of the weapon itself would uh, guide, in my opinion, would guide you on the possible ways that it could be like used. So like um there's the rules, the parameters guiding the implementation. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. And so um there was this need to like get training weapons that were like mm-hmm. as close as possible. And there was honestly there was no one that was making anything like it. So 
um, we had a few scrap pieces of uh, HGPE. And I remember my first sword that I made out of that material was these uh, Nimsha sabers. And they were horrible. But, uh, <laughs> you know, they served the purpose for class. And okay. and once I got, and once we did that, we did we we started to make more for mm. basically for our group right um and it started to like grow i mean before that we were using like taped up like sticks yep. to represent swords um and yeah we got better at doing that and then um we basically like took an activity that was like primarily for our group we were doing it in the in my front yard, and like you know, we transformed it over the years into a, a, a into a not just a business, but into a um, I don't know what you would call it. You know, like I, I think that we're probably like the first of our kind. It's um, its own culture. It sounds like. Yeah, most definitely, most definitely. Like you know, who would have thought that we we're like? And I, that's another thing. Like I always wanted to make swords as a kid. Mm. But I felt like, you know, of course, with everything being so like mystical and mystifying, it's like it was like it seemed like it was always just like outside of my reach. I mm. would never be able to do it. And here we are. We're making swords out of steel, aluminum, bronze, plastic, wood. And it's like um, the sky is the limit, really. And that's it's great. Like, that's, yeah, it's really, really amazing. That's awesome. If people want to check out those swords and the other stuff that you've got going on, I know you sent over some websites. We'll put them in the show notes, but make sure you mention them here for people, please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can come um, check check me out on my YouTube channel, Demonstith. Um, we typically do like cut videos and like different test videos on mm-hmm. my YouTube channel. Um, you can go to the, uh, you want to come on? Come on, come on out here. What if no one asked you? But he's, he's videoing right now, though. So like, let's put on that professional face. Talk about media. This is my best. How's it hat. going? How's it going? What What are we doing? Uh, ways to reach us. Ways to reach us. Uh, Instagram Street Forge Armory. Armory spelled with a uh, O U R Y. <laughs> um, basically across all social media platforms, Street Forge Armory. Facebook, Facebook, Instagram, Instagram TikTok. TikTok. I don't know if we have a Snapchat. I'm old. Yeah, no Snapchat yet. I don't Snapchat. remember if we have a Snapchat. We don't. Or not. We don't. <laughs> okay. Etsy, Street Forge, Armory. Okay. Both. Yes. You know what I'm saying? With the, with the U. And the O. And the O. And then the yep. M-O-R-Y. Awesome. Yeah. But yeah. Good stuff. All right. Yeah. Um, and so we end in a, in a similar way every time I, I kick it back to the guest, you know, what do you want your last words to the audience to be today? <sighs> um, gosh, it's a lot of pressure. Um, thank you. Thank you all for, um, your support over the years. Uh, we couldn't, um, do what we've done without your support. And, um, there are a lot of people that have like, really really like rock with us from the beginning so thank you uh thank you to my partner here um as much as he gets on my nerves it's uh <laughs> it'd be it'd be a lot a lot a lot lonelier a lot longer doing this by myself so i'm really appreciative of, of that uh i regret everything i'm saying right now um <laughs> um but um check us out you know what i'm saying um Support. We still need lots of support. You know, buy a sword or two. Um, do some research on African martial arts, and you know, um, if anybody's ever interested in learning more and being involved with Hama, um, contact me. I will help in that in any way possible. High walls keep the village small. Tear them down. Let's rebuild, because if the lights go out, we'll need each other. When I went into this episode, I I wasn't quite sure what was going to happen. I had expected that Damon's path would be fairly similar to most of ours. He started training with someone and learned some stuff and 
wanted to go deeper, did some research. But what struck me most in his story was his willingness to continue to hunt for information, to rediscover information in a way that the only other time I've heard this discussed in this way has to do with historical European martial arts. We've had some guests on the show who've talked about finding some of these texts and figuring things out because there was no one that understood them. Now, of course, we've come a long way and because of the internet, we can share information a lot better, but it takes a really special person to want to hunt for that information, to rediscover anything that was essentially lost. And I give a lot of credit to Damon and those around him for putting in that work. And I look forward to seeing where this journey takes them. Audience, if you want to go deeper on this episode, go check out the show notes at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. This is episode 822. And personally to Damon, thank you for coming on and thank you for being so honest and open with your story. If you want to support us, the best way you can do that is supporting our sponsor for today's episode, Kataro. K-A-T-A-A-R-O.com. You can save 10% on your first order of the best belt you could ever get or displays. They do a number of things. Belts is what they're known for, but I would encourage you to check out their website, even if you think you know everything that they do. If for no other reason, then please help them help us. Help us help them. Use the code WK10, capital W, capital K, number one, number zero. Number zero. The number zero at kataro.com, K-A-T-A-A-R-O.com. And if you want to help us directly, there are still things you can do. You can join the Patreon. You can leave reviews, share episodes, tell your friends about what we do. All of that is appreciated. You can also bring me in for a seminar or bring our team in to help with your martial arts school and help it grow. Revenue, profit, culture, enrollment. What is holding you back? Let's work on it together. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.